Okay. Well, I hope people are, are joining. We're going to get started in just a few moments. All right, do my fellow panelists want to, to join the, the webinar? Yes, hello. Hello. Hi there. Hello. All right, let's see. Oh, I'm gonna stop the share. All right, I see people are filtering in. I'm gonna share some things here to everyone. I think I did that correctly. Um, I just wanna welcome everyone this morning. It's June the 7th. Uh, my name is Eric Baldwin. I'm a professor and program director at New York University. And we are going to do a talk about our ongoing research on transit costs. Um, the overwhelming you know, purpose of this research is to figure out how to build transit infrastructure uh, more quickly and more cheaply. And when Alan, Levy, and I started working on this, we were very excited to learn from other countries and other cities to see what they were doing. And two of the countries and cities, because one is a country in this instance, um, that we were very excited to learn about were you know, Italy and, and Istanbul and Turkey, because uh, both those places have built a lot of infrastructure and built it very cheaply and have innovated over the last 30, 40 years. So we're very, very excited to have uh, Marco and Aleph uh, talk to us about what they've learned over the past year and a half or so. Um, our cases are up on our website, transitcosts.com. Um, I'm going to just say a few more things, and we also want to say thank you to our, our moderator, Jerusalem Demzas from The Atlantic, who is sort of the most expert in, in these topics currently. Um, so again, we chose Italy and Turkey because low cost, they've built a lot of stuff. There's a lot that we can learn. Marco and Aleph are gonna get into that in more detail. And then the last thing I want to say is if you're interested in sort of the work that we've been doing, um, we're gonna continue putting out some cases. Um, Alan has been hard at work on a case in, in Sweden and we've been working on a case in New York. Um, and those will come out in the next several months. Uh, definitely by the fall, we'll have another event, I think. Um, and then going forward, we're looking at uh, high-speed rail on the Northeast Corridor, trying to figure out how to do that more cheaply. Also, sort of stealing our, our methods and practices from this project to see what other places are doing. Um, we're also going to look at a couple other infrastructure projects, um, take a look at the Interborough Express in New York and try to look at the land use piece as well as the infrastructure piece. Um, and there are a couple other exciting things. If anyone wants to know more, send us a note. Uh, I've included some links to you know, the Marin um, newsletter and our website. And if you want to get in touch, please do. But with that, I'm gonna kick it over to Jerusalem and thank you very much for joining everyone. Thank you, Eric. Um, I'm excited for this conversation. So um, looking through these, both of these case studies that are, again, now on the website, so you should go read them. There's tons of detail in there that I'm sure we won't be able to fully get into on this call. Um, but looking at both of them, the, the big thing that I think there's a difference coming from the American context is this kind of nebulous idea of state capacity, which political scientists have generally sort of defined as being the ability for, um, you know, the, the, the alignment between the priorities of the state and its ability to actually implement them. And there's a lot that goes into that. But um, what I want to start off with is to have uh, Marco and Aleph kind of uh, give us a sense of how they would rate um, Istanbul and Italy on um, how good they are on this measure when it comes to mass transit and then give us a little bit of color on on how they would um, justify that rating. So I know it's a little bit uh, anodyne, maybe a rating up from one to 10 and then just a sense of like how you arrive on that on that dimension. So Marco, maybe you wanna go first? Okay, <laughs> I don't know if it's uh, very easy to rank it from one to 10. And I, I would say that it really depends on the sector and on specific uh, issues like uh, uh, building infrastructure or managing different kind of programs. But let's say that for infrastructure, we can say that Italy is around seven, let's say, somehow like in the sufficient part, but a lot of rooms for improvement. I think the very interesting part, if I can like uh, 
what, what is this nebulous thing you were talking about, like about state capacity is really, it's really the capacity of the different parts of composed like that are within or around the different level of government, like from the national ministries, the local governments and so on. It's really a fact that there is uh, a sort of diffuse knowledge of how to do things. I, I want to give an example because it's very, it can be very nebulous, but this thing that maybe we'll talk about more later about like a, a reference unit costs that are diffusely used in Italy, that are used also in Turkey, the fact that they are public, the fact that they are updated regularly, the fact that, for example, every time there are new construction technique, like the new uh, one that was developed in the late 90s, early 2000s, which is what it's called ADECO RS, then it was kind of introduced as a sort of norms and this is diffused the knowledge about this in publishing food uh, journals, specific, uh, like specific uh, uh, public administration meeting and so on. And also the fact that there is this, this sort of sharing of knowledge across institutional and non-institutional actors, universities and uh, the Italian tunneling society and things like that that promotes the diffusion of knowledge. And uh, I think this is very, and for example, you see also this in uh, when the new norm for fire, uh, fire norm was devised in the 2013-15. In Italy, who are the people in the commission that devised this based on NFPA 130, the infamous uh, uh, international norm? It was a bunch of people coming from uh, uh, mainly municipally or uh, locally controlled uh, uh, design agencies like Metropolitana Milanese, Infrato, or the places like that. So it's uh, and other people from university and so on. So I think it's really this capacity of sharing knowledge and also sharing it more freely and more openly uh, across a wider public. Yeah, I think that uh, it's one of the things that in the U.S. there's a massive problem of not really getting that sort of ecosystem going. Um, and I know that journalists try to oversimplify, but Aleph, I'm also going to ask you to do the same thing. Can you can you help us kind of understand how to place Istanbul on on the state capacity sort of scale, obviously, as it relates to, to mass transit? Um, so again, it's, it's hard to um, talk about the scale like from one to 10. Maybe I will also say seven. Um, uh, but a big part of the picture in Istanbul has been the sustained political will to uh, build rail. Um, there are two entities, the local government, the municipal government, that's uh, mostly built rail in Istanbul uh, within the last uh, three decades. And then also the central government, because Istanbul is such an important city for the, for the country, they have also uh, been uh, building rail. And um, in the case of the local government, both um, right and left wing political parties have um, really um, um, placed a lot of, um, so they've both been willing to uh, build um, public transit, um, heavy rail. Uh, and um, building rail is a part of their, um, their political campaigns. There's uh, a lot of demand for it. Um, only 20% of the trips in Istanbul have been um, on personal vehicles. So there is a dire need. And also the population grew really fast within the um, last decade. So um, this has been really important for all governments. And um, if you look at the internal capacities of um, the agencies for building rail, they have uh, it didn't start here, but within the last few decades, it grew rapidly because of building so much. Um, and especially because uh, within this time, because there was always one or even more uh, rail projects that were ongoing. Um, there were always jobs for contractors and consultants in the market. And um, the agencies learned from them and they cultivated this uh, rail construction industry. So. Um, that way there was a collective learning process, so the, the capacity grew. And I'd love to kind of get in, because both of you mentioned sort of this idea of the countries learning how to build um, transit and refining their institutions and creating institutional capacity. And I'd like kind of get an understand like how that works differently in your states. Like how does it actually work? Like where is this learning centered? Is it among contractors? Is it among state officials? How are they passing information among each other? Like what are the most important components here that you think that you'd like to draw out? So um, Aleph, if you want to start. 
Um, yeah, sure. So uh, it happens both uh, within the agencies and among the contractors and the consultants because of building so much. Um, but one of the examples that we can talk about um, regarding the agency has been um, streamlining their processes uh, for rail construction. So, for example, in the early years of building, uh, the uh, municipality would not uh, procure a preliminary design document that was um, so well developed that it, it is now. And that's why they wouldn't have the knowledge and the command over the project um, like they do today when going to uh, the construction uh, tenders. And so over time, because of uh, you know establishing this um, procurement preliminary design procurement process, they've uh, come to um, understand uh, the projects better. They've learned to ask for optimizations from the contractors. Um, so really, it um, uh, they. They, they learn throughout this um, process and uh, also develop their um, all, all their processes for the procurement. And Marco, same question. And I'd love if you could explain um, sort of the reference unit cost thing here as well. Yeah, I mean, this is, uh, I think this is a great example because, you know, that when you go into procurement, uh, you want the state to be a, uh, like an informed uh, customer, like uh, someone that knows what, what they are buying, what they are doing, and exactly know what they want to do. And they can even leverage the knowledge of the contractors if they have some particularly uh, had, uh, had cutting edge uh, knowledge about something. The thing is really, this is a tool, I mean, the, if you compare about with the secrecy about cost and, uh, uh, you know, about everyone doing his own estimates and never sharing anything and a lot of jealousy about this kind of information. I mean, I think here in Canada, we are even worse about this than compared to the United States. But this, a lot of, I mean, putting this publicly on a website where you can download it and everybody can see it and say, I know, People, I know that this elevator should cost between 20 and 30,000 euros. Then, you know, we can discuss about some issues and so on, but like refining these tools, it took, it took two decades to have this kind of tool out. Even more, if you think that the first ones that were deployed were in the 70s by the Chamber of Commerce for the private sector use, and then every agency was doing its own in the 90s when this became compulsory. And then they realized that every agency could not do this, so they gathered this at the regional level and now they are refined at the regional level, but what do we do with material costs that increase that are very, that fluctuates but more, much more than labor costs. So we have to update it yearly. And now it's again learning because now with the high inflation that we're experiencing on the material after let's say two decades of like, like uh, stagnant prices, it's really something that the system is not in crisis, but it has to learn and to be improved again. And I think this is really interesting way how this kind of uh, knowledge can be put together and put, I mean, it's at the table for everybody to have a common understanding of how things should cost, for example. And also, I mean, in general knowledge, it's, it's a bit different. It, Italy is a heavily bureaucratic society in the way a state is managed and there is a bureaucratical culture that everything is made very procedural, much more, I, I think, than in Turkey. But, at the same time, I think there is, for example, having this, I would call them fortress of knowledge, like uh, Metropolitana Milanese is a very nice example of this, that they set up that in the 1955 when they started building the subway. And even with the up and down of financing, we haven't experienced this kind of 300 kilometers in 20 years. I mean, that's the total amount of metros that are in Italy in general, but it's really was able to like keep going, having some routines, having a lot of soft knowledge that was kept within the perimeter or near the perimeter of the public administration of the civil service. And I think this is very important for, uh, well, maybe we can talk about it later, but also Turin is a, is a nice example of how this was built relatively quickly from a city that didn't have such a long history of uh, internal knowledge. Yeah. and. Eric and Alan, if either of you could kind of just jump in here and help us kind of relate this to the US um, and its 
uh, or other countries and their inability or uh, ability to kind of like learn from transit infrastructure projects. Like why haven't other countries been able to replicate this um, in the same way as, um, you know, in Istanbul or in Italy? So um, the countries that I've looked at, um, for the most part, do have this. So in, uh, in Sweden, the planning is done um, internally. Uh, it can be by a state agency uh, called Traffic Administration or Traffic Verket. Uh, the, the name has changed many times in the last couple of decades, but it was set up uh, actually with the American uh, Early Road Building uh, Program as its, uh, um, as its kind of inspiration. Um, and, uh, or, or, or their municipal or, or county uh, agencies. And, um, and yeah, and a lot of it is done through internal learning. Uh, although it has changed, um, let's say the last 15, 20 years in favor of more consultants and that has not been a positive thing. Um, or even in, for example, France. In France, it's kind of the same story. Um, they're slowly transitioning to more consultants because they're trying to be England. England happens to have Europe's highest construction costs. Um, but RATP, the uh, agency that runs the Paris Metro, um, it also does construction. They have 2,000 engineers on staff. They are the consultant. So, so in the same way that um, Turkey is pretty centered on Istanbul, uh, France is incredibly centered on Paris. Um, Paris is also the political capital, Istanbul isn't. Um, so RATP, uh, um, often acts as a consultant to smaller cities um, that do not have these uh, do not have their own ability to build things. So RATP will consult will be the consultant for uh, Bordeaux, Lille, uh, Lyon, um, cities like that that want to build their own metro systems. So it's something that does happen elsewhere. Sometimes the results are similar to those of um, Italy and the results of Turkey. Sweden was probably about as cheap up until. 50 uh, up until just now to be honest um in france it's more expensive but there are other things i will say that turkey and italy and let's say spain and sweden do right maybe france and germany don't do well so so so, so this kind of state capacity thing is one of several factors um the united states or, or let's say britain that they unfortunately lack the, the only thing i'd add to that is sort of sort of the generational pace at which we go sometimes makes learning across projects challenging. Um, I, I've spoken with a number of agencies here in the States who you know, have built something, they've maybe learned something, but then haven't built something again. Um, so not able to implement it. And then uh, things like reference cost pricing that exists as I understand it, at the state DOT level for road projects, oftentimes, you know, sort of non-complicated, uh, you know, repeatable projects, but on transit projects, it's sort of considered that these are unique and it would be very challenging to, to sort of generate that kind of precise or even a range of costs for, for some of that stuff. That would be um, sort of a guideline for different agencies. And then the other thing is agencies definitely do speak to each other uh, here in the States. Um, and just from some of the examples I, I've heard from, there isn't often necessarily like a public output from it though. And so it's not necessarily clear that, you know, people learn anything from examples and, and other, from other cities. I'm not gonna get into any names right now. Um, and I've definitely spoken with, you know, capital construction folks at agencies that have spoken to each other. And then they've sort of said, yeah, I don't know what the status of that is. Like we did reach out and we did share some materials, but I don't know that we learned anything or, um, and I think that, you know, it's sort of a bit more informal and um, there is sort of someone at the agency at a high level has to be very proactive about it. Um, and if that person isn't there, then it, even if the junior people are talking to each other and learning lots of stuff, it's not gonna filter up and sort of affect uh, anything in particular. Yeah, and I, I would love to get a sense from um, Aleph and Marco how, what role centralization thus is playing in um, uh, in the ability for your states um, to implement these policies. So like, I know, Marco, you kind of traced the history of um, Italy's rail uh, uh, projects from the early 1900s to, to now. Can you just talk to us about the centralization of power or the ability to have like one central person? Like how, how impactful was that? 
I mean, it's it's um, it's it's complicated if I can answer. Like uh, the the reality is that Italy is a heavily centralized state for norms and uh, how procedures work. I mean, municipalities cannot decide how to run their procurement. It's everything is very strictly defined by national and regional laws. Uh, but at the same time, there is, for example, I can see there's this centralization of ownership on the local level. This is very important. I mean, the centrality of municipal governments for most transit projects is fundamental. It's not someone else's project. It's the mayor or, or the city council or whatever. It's a city government's project. Uh, there is not this idea that is a kind of project, nobody's project, the orphan of uh, that we sometimes feel in North America. It's not quite clear. You have seen this recently in Montreal, where the uh, LM the last project kind of derailed because the city was involved, not involved. It was unclear who who is the owner of this project. And the, the centrality of municipal government in Italy about carrying out the project, having the ownership of the project, and uh, at the same time, the state, for example, the central government, especially lately, comes really in as a kind of financial backer and assuring that they are financing projects that make financial and uh, social sense. I mean, it's well spent. It's a project that generates ridership. It's in a good place. And it's the, I mean, they are spending the right amount of money. I mean, if someone comes with a bill compared to Second Avenue subway in Italy for a subway, the government will just you know, open his eyes and say, what? <laughs> I mean, no possible. They are making a lot of problems for Rome to finish their own like very costly central section of Rome that is way less expensive. But I think this is really, I mean, it, it, it plays a role in the fact that, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to find a balance because it's not always so easy and there are a lot of conflicts going on and so on. But I think it's, uh, it's important that it, it, it it's, for projects in Italy, or not everywhere, huh? it depends. There are places where gov local governments are more, let's say, uh, capable of running projects compared to other places. But it's really that they can go through uh, the procedure, they can go through, and they have this leading role in projects that seems missed sometimes in, uh, uh, in North America. And Aleph? Yeah, and in, in the case of Turkey, it gets, it gets um, kind of complicated too. Um, so when the um, local government in Istanbul, the municipality was run by the um, uh, right-wing political party that's in um, power in Turkey right now. So the central government and the local government were run by the same uh, political party, then things were easier um, for um, way of building. Because a lot of times uh, approvals, especially regarding the budgets, um, come from the central government. Uh, if there's an increase to be made in the budgets, again, that has to be approved by the central government. And it was much easier then. But in 2019, um, the uh, local government changed to the uh, left wing political party, the main opposition party. So uh, we started to see some issues with you know, delaying approvals um, and so on. Uh, however, um, of course, uh, the power is very centralized in, in Turkey, and we've seen in projects of uh, like national uh, importance, such as the Marmaray, um, when there was going to be a doubling of a budget and it had a really large budget, we saw that, that the central government just, you know, approved everything very quickly and let it all um, move uh, very smoothly. And, there wasn't any, you know, opposition uh, for that from anyone. And at the macro level, um, both of you sort of identify these like larger trends, um, both urbanization as being a factor, um, and of course, like congestion um, as being a massive driver for why um, transit became a priority for your respective governments. And I guess the question is like, both of these trends are not obviously not unique to um, countries that do transit well. So what is it about your countries that led urbanization and congestion to spur the political will to build mass transit um, versus other things. Like I have like a vague sense potentially Aleph that like the low personal car ownership rate that you mentioned of 20% um, may have made it necessary for there to be alternative options in order for there to be economic growth. But obviously Marco, Italy has extremely high car ownership rates. This is not like something that can be fully explanatory. So um, I don't know if either of you have, have thoughts on that. 
Um, maybe I can say um, public transit has always been in demand in Istanbul. We've had buses, um, mini buses, um, trams. So for years, the governments have seen that when there is public transit, it is used. Um, like peak hours of peak hours, they're always in demand. So uh, I think they saw the potential and the rapid growth, um, uh, rapid construction of housing and um, the commercial building. So uh, it, it was obvious to them that it would be used. And as soon as uh, the line started being built, um, it, it was seen that you know this was clearly the solution. And still there's more demand, there's more building going on and there's, um, you know, it will keep growing the network uh, at, at its um, pace. Um, I mean, it's, uh, it, it's complicated again in the sense that Italy has extremely high car ownership and there was a precise uh, political will to increase it dramatically in the post war years was seen as one of the like uh, goal of the government to promote car ownership. But at the same time, the government really wasn't much involved in local infrastructure. The Italian government has really like shied away from local infrastructure for very long, uh, both for car and transit until the, uh, let's say the eighties. Just Rome was a, like a particular case because it was the capital city, but that uh, the general story is that really in the eighties, we started to do like talking about this uh, steel therapy, like providing uh, uh, like rail-based transit were needed in many cities. So the same time when France was starting its tramway revolution, Italy was kind of trying to start its own tramway revolution that went somehow derailed for many reasons, uh, including the crisis that happened in 92 and then uh, uh, many other factors. Uh, it's catching up. I mean, if you see the curbs of uh, uh, new transit uh, lines open in Italy, it's going by decades. Uh, there were like 20, 30 kilometers open in the 80s, 70s, and so on. And now we are heading for 70, 80, and maybe more than 100 in the next decade. So it's kind of building up momentum very slowly because of budgetary constraints, because of many, but it's kind of, there has been a learning curve and especially the reforms that have been put in place after 2016. I mean, it's different and, uh, you know, Italy changed the government every time like normal people changes our shirt. And uh, this is really something, but there's been kind of underlying consensus, both on the right and on the left. For example, you see it in local governments like in Lombardy, ruled by the right wing government, uh, right wing, sorry, parties forever, but they kind of committed to expand transit, rail based transit in the, in the region. So there has been this kind of, um, at least in some part of the country, underlying consensus that I mean, for, because for example, the other option like building uh, motorways through cities is unconceivable in Italy. I mean, nobody would like, it. it's unthinkable to demolish houses to widen a freeway. They can put it underground maybe and so on. There were ideas like that, but the reality, it's kind of makes it reality. There is this, I mean, general awareness that we need more transit. Then how, how much, how funded and so on, it varies among the, uh, the political spectrum. And Eric, I don't know. I don't know if you have thoughts here because I mean, I, I think that the the point you just made, Marco, about just kind of widening freeways is just kind of culturally impossible there. And I know that the uh, work that's been done on, on Madrid also points out like the political ideas of the importance of mass transit are kind of inculcated in the population already. And I just wonder, like, how much of that is just endogenous the entire process like what why is it that the population is so amenable and eager for mass transit um i mean and coming from obviously from the american perspective where we just don't see that at all well i think that, uh, a couple things i think one if you look at other countries you know japan and korea come to mind where it just economically was not feasible to build roadways everywhere and so they had to come up with other solutions um, i think you know Intuitively, it makes sense when you think of, you know, a medieval city being protective of, you know, not wanting a road uh, slammed through it. That 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 does make sense. Um, but we also have seen here in the states sort of both things where uh, people have objected to, you know, freeways and and things of, of that sort. And 
but people also object to, to subways, right? So if you object to everything, and I know this is one of your, this is your beat as well, um, you know, it, it leaves you in a, a difficult position. And I think just the leadership of elected officials is not always, it's not always so clear what the vision is. You know, in a lot of interviews with sort of, you know, engineers and designers, you know, they, at least the couple, a couple I've spoken to, you know, they hold up Copenhagen as being this great example of, of, of their, their subway. And one person I spoke to made the point that, you know, the city had a very clear vision of what it wanted. It wanted to bring people, you know, from the outlying areas into sort of the periphery and then have a way for them to circulate within the city. Um, and then they said, when you talk about people in, in the States or other places with very high costs, they have this different idea of, well, they want to bring in these very big commuter trains into the center of the city and that's very expensive. And so you can't do that much of it. And if they had a clearer vision of how all these things are integrated and work together, you could, you know, get a lot more infrastructure per dollar and move a lot more people. And I think, you know, that's, that's part of it. And I think going back to what Marco and um, Aleph have mentioned about leadership and governance is that, you know, if you don't have that governor, you don't have that senator, you don't have that mayor sort of, you know, just pounding, you know, their fist, making this point over and over again, you know, no one's going to do it. Like our, you know, using New York as an example, you know, people don't understand necessarily who controls the, the MTA. And so then governors and mayors don't have to get that involved and they can just use it as, you know, a whipping boy when there's a problem rather than saying, okay, the MTA can actually be part of the solution and we can do some really great stuff and let's invest in this long-term plan and let's have a vision. And I think some of what you see in maybe Seattle and out in Los Angeles is it like moves more in that direction. There, there's some problems, um, but I don't think we see it as much, um, you know, in most other parts of the country. The, that's a that's a Los Angeles and Seattle are things that make me a little bit wary because their costs are exploding right now. So Seattle built uh, U Link, so that that's the extension of the Link Light Rail subway to the university. They built it at semi reasonable cost, and by semi reasonable, I mean maybe the same cost that we see at at the more expensive projects in Germany. Um, but costs that actually exist in non-Anglo um, developed countries, um, and now the and, and now there are kind of next big urban subway. It's the Ballard uh, West Seattle line. Um, I think that line might actually be six hundred and fifty million dollars a kilometer, and I think it's only one third underground. Um, so, and, and LA had this kind of explosion maybe ten years ago, and the the red line um, to North Hollywood was being done. At Again, it's a it's an expense at a it's a medium to high end cost for Germany, but maybe you could explain it because of earthquakes. And now, right now, what what's happening with Wilshire? It's just very bad. So I'm so I mean, it's possible that because of this badness, they they understand that they have a problem and they're trying to do better. But at least if you compare costs there now to costs 10, 15, 20 years ago, at least at that scale, the trend is negative. It's a, it's a big problem. In, in the United States or, or, or even in the rest of the Anglo so you see a place and you say, oh, that place is good. And then you, you check 10 years later and it screws up. Vancouver has the same problem. Um, and Marco, one, one thing that I think is, uh, you know, a little bit of hope from from the Italian case is that you know there is a, a time period where Italy has higher costs and it's able to constructively as a country work to build them uh, bring them down and um, can you just talk to us about kind of like the corruption scandals of the 90s and, and why and how that kind of led to improved governance on these issues? I, mean, I think this is an interesting case because I know I mean a lot of the image international Italy has derives from this like the aftermath of this big big uh, political and uh, uh, judiciary scandals of the 80s and 90s that brought the collapse of the political system like Berlusconi mm -hmm. came from what's the, the Italian term Tangentopoli it's like thank bribe you, burger you. bribe town or something like that I mean a lot of those scandals involved some of the big construction uh, metros projects that were going on at the time like Naples uh, part of it or uh, Rome, a few projects in Rome and M3 in Milan. 
and there was a systematic system. I mean, it's it's this, the procurement system was opaque, it was uh, uncompetitive. Uh, there was a lot of this like uh, turn style between state owned companies, private sector, very opaque system in general. And when things collapsed, and then this happened at the same time as where there was the, the lira thrown out of the uh, uh, small, uh, like monetary European monetary system, it was a big like uh, that to do an emergency government, the first of our endless technical governments to try to fix stuff uh, and everything. And, this is where things a bit started. We realized it was impossible and the pressure of Europe for European integration to opening up the market to competition and so on. I mean, there was a general, many, there was a lot of pushback, of course, because there are a lot of interests that are touched in this kind of reform, but it started like a long thread of reforms with a bit of like, you know, back and forth, back and forth, depending on government. But like the 1994, first big reform of procurement. I mean, the first big one comprehensive since 1894. It was the, the old law that was still in effect. And then, you know, this kind of like a benchmark prices, uh, procurement, the in-house design, and uh, a lot of this switching from lowest bid to uh, technical scoring, like best value for money, uh, procurement, a lot of, I mean, it's a lot of like fine tuning that went on. There was another reform in 2006 and then another one in 2007 and then a major one compiling into a code of this very Napoleonic approach to making codes in 2016. So, I mean, there was a general awareness and I'm creating database. We have database of like pricking cost of projects a lot, uh, over time that are accessible to everybody and maintained by the parliament, by the budgetary commission of the parliament. I mean, it's a lot of little thing that, I mean, they really stress out this idea that we have to spend less, we have to spend better, we have to be more wise in how we spend money. And of course, the austerity and uh, like external constraints about, uh, you know, like not having simply to throw 1 billion more at the project just because uh, this was really a pressure because it's either this way or you don't, or the highway, as it is. Like it's, a, there was a lot of external pressure, but a lot of, I mean, comparatively, in Italy, you have newspapers talking about the fact that they will raise or lower the threshold for uncompetitive bidding from 75,000 euros, now 150, now this is, will uh, drag more corruption and so on. I've never seen anything talk like this in Canada or North America. I mean, it's, there is a real concern because it's, I mean, the public has been burned by these scandals. There's, it's very something that uh, goes in the skin of people very deeply and maybe even too much sometimes. But it's really, I mean, the, the, it, it was across the general public, the politicians, the newspaper, and every like piece of the society was concerned by this issue. Um, and then one thing I wanted to ask about across both countries is how your nations uh, deal with historic preservation, because I think that obviously both have um, a good, great culture and focus and cultural importance placed on different heritage sites, um, but it clearly has not stopped um, the ability for transit to be built effectively and cheaply. So um, LF, I don't know if we'll start with you. Sure, yes, uh, Istanbul is known for its archaeological heritage and um, especially in the Marmaray project, this was a, an important factor. They revealed remains that go as much as like 8,000 years um, on this, at every station site. Um, so the construction was seriously delayed. Um, however, there didn't exist a framework like it does in Italy that Marco I'm sure will uh, talk about right, um, in a bit. Uh, to regulate how um, archaeological remains should be dealt with uh, during the uh, rail construction project. It's very tricky because <clears throat> you have to wait for everything to be uncovered. You, you have these archaeological teams working all over the site and all the construction equipment is just waiting there. Um, so what happened was, I think here, um, the, I can talk about flexibility on um, especially both on the agency and the contractor side, but uh, what the contractors did was, um, so in, in these cases, the uh, museums directors get involved and they oversee all the archeological work that's going on. And the con um, contractors are kind of aiding the whole process. And uh, what they did was um, to speed up the 
processes, the approvals to make sure everything was going um, as smoothly as possible. Um, they established this um, kind of this uh, efficient communication with the museum's directors, and um, they um, had teams visiting them regularly, um, like running everything by them first and also trying to make sure um, they procured all their needs because it all went through the contractor and procured all their needs um, in a timely manner so that they really did their best to ease the archeologists work. And it turned out like, although there were extensive delays because of this and it was unavoidable, um, it ended up ultimately saving them. Like they learned throughout the process. In the beginning, things would move very like much slower, but later, um, they they uh, learned to kind of communicate well and manage the whole process. Um, and archaeology is still uh, like we hear of um, remains being uh, discovered at different uh, sites. Uh, it's still an issue, but I think the both the agencies and the um, contractors are learning to um, deal with it better. But it definitely is a, a one of the, the biggest constraints. And Marco? Yes, I mean, uh, how Italy deal with that by having higher costs in city centers. If I can share uh, uh, um, some images from the, uh, you see it? Oh, no, I didn't show no. you there see the, yeah. yeah. So good. for example, this is a repertory of like 80 something station across uh, uh, six projects, like, so the cost of the station, so civil works, uh, uh, make escalators, finishing, and everything that is in the station. And if you look at the cost in like stations that are in the city centers, they are extremely more expensive. Uh, this is quite inevitable because you have to go deeper because regulation about archaeology and heritage in Italy are extremely strict. I mean, the, you, the, it's a no, no, no harm done uh, approach, like no harm at all. Uh, the, the thing is really that it can delay is like in, in Rome case and even in Naples case, in Naples case, you have like 300 million pro just like archeology span digging conservation and then exhibition in station. Or in Rome, you have a similar approach that a whole station and section has to be redesigned just to accommodate archeological finding. One positive thing is that there has been, I mean, when talking about state capacity, there has been a sort of reaction when both Rome's and Naples projects were completely halted in 2008 because of uh, archaeological findings. There was a czar nominated for that, and they say, okay, let's come up with a protocol, a way of approaching, because we know our cities are old, we know they are filled of stuff underground. You have to, to, to establish a procedure to do that. Otherwise, we won't dig any more uh, metros in city center. It, it, and it's where the demand is. So they came up with a protocol and the idea is, okay, it will add some upfront cost. It will add some upfront cost for designing and so on, because we have to do more surveys, more pre-digging, pre more, a lot more like uh, anal analysis before and even lengthening a bit the construction to allow for this digging. But at least we will avoid this five, six years delay that you experienced in Rome or even more in Naples with a station that has been under construction for 20 something years, uh, Duomo. And this is an approach that is kind of saying, okay, this will add cost, we know. This is like our like uh, black hole, but at least we can do something uh, about it. But sometimes there are constraints, then we can ask ourselves if it's, if it's worth spending so much to preserve uh, some uh, Roman temples or remaining of a boat and so on, but this is not like it. it's out out of my <laughs> capacity to say if it's worth or not. Uh, I'm sure Alan is gonna tell me I'm being Americentric again, but uh, I, <laughs> I am. Um, can we can we situate uh, this approach to historic preservation against what the U.S. and um, Canada and Britain um, do, uh, and and you know why? I don't know, Alan, if you have thoughts on that. Yeah. So um, the American approach specifically. Um, and again, it's, it's, it's different for the British or Canadian one. It's incredibly adversarial. So essentially everything is enforced by lawsuit and there is a culture in which nothing is ever final. Everything can be constantly and constantly and constantly litigated and fought over. Um, 
And, uh, and again, this is the approach to everything. So questions like, does this project uh, endanger um, vulnerable species? That is a question that is answered by the courts. So you're expected to, to produce an environmental impact statement. Um, groups can sue uh, if they don't like what is said there. And the ultimate answer is gonna be always given by a uh, judge in this case. Um, and uh, this is very, and, and the same is true of uh, historical preservation. Historical preservation is an environmental impact that groups can sue over. Um, if you're just a random NIMBY who strongly, and you strongly believe that your 1927 building is historically significant, um, and you can pay lawyers and you can call yourself a representative of the community, then people will have to listen to you. Um, and again, it's, it's, a very di it's very different from the bureaucratic approach in which um, there are, let's say, ecologists who check whether uh, there are endangered species in the area or whether uh, the or whether regulations on air pollution or noise um, are being met. And, um, oh, and the same is true of the historic preservation, which Italy is very strict about. Italy is very strict about historic preservation and Marco, you should probably explain this better than I, uh, than I will, but, um, but it's entirely bureaucratic there. Um, and again, and again, that's maybe U.S. versus Southern Europe or, uh, or, or Turkey. Again, the other places may be doing it differently. In Germany, it's a mix. Um, and the NIMBY lawsuits here have substantially, or the threat of lawsuits, have, that has substantially increased the costs of German infrastructure, of, let's say, German high-speed railways. Um, so, so, that is def so that is a problem that I think this is the worst at, but it's, the only, not, it's not the only country that has that problem. It's strange you didn't consider the fact that American history is just more important than all other countries' history. So that's why it's so costly. Is that not it? Okay. No, 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 no it's not. I'm, uh, I'm sorry. Um, there are um, really important. There are really important historical things in Berlin, for example. <laughs> um, but Marco, I did want to ask because one of the things you read about in your um, uh, case study is that there's this principle that like the state is uh, and the public administration are responsible for pursuing the public interest. And of course, as Alan has kind of delineated, this is not something that's like just naturally happens in, in, in the US. And um, of course, we have public interest groups in particular, because there is this idea that the state does not necessarily hold that. Like, does that cultural norm, like how much of a role does that play in the ability to kind of, um, you know, deal with historic preservation or environmental regulations um, in a straightforward manner rather than kind of a belief there's like you know how do we get this cultural norm to exist in Italy and and is that just a, um, a facet of just idiosyncrasies from culture or is there something going on here that the state's really doing? Uh, well, well that's a very hard question to answer I mean I, I don't know if I can really compare but it, it's true that in general the, the so-called Napoleonic system or like civil code or whatever you want to call it there is the centrality of the state it doesn't mean the central state I mean the whole articulation of the as being the representative of the common good. That is why, for example, if in France and in Italy too, there is this declaration of public interest and the approving of a, of a project of a project comes through this declaration that say, what we are doing is for the public interest. So you can go forward with land acquisition with kind of hindering some uh, uh, like, uh, I mean, part, uh, I mean uh, sorry. Uh, I mean, you can act against the will of people or some people, or you can even, they can be compensated, the law protect the, the rights of people to property, to doing stuff, to business, of course. But at the same time, there is this idea okay, that, okay, this is the, for the common good, and so we can go on at a certain point. And the way of do dealing, for example, for uh, archaeology or uh, heritage or uh, uh, things like the environmental uh, review process that exists in Italy, uh, it can be, I mean, it can be more or less heavy depending on the amount of the, the, the type of project. Normally, uh, transit projects go through the light uh, procedure, while like things like high-speed rail or motorways, like they go through the heavy procedure. Uh, but the thing is really, it's a process that is intended as part of the design process, not as a way like to 
uh, inform the public. It is informal. Now we have introduced in very lately the public debate, like uh, shaped on the French debat public. But the idea is really that it's something where you make clear what are the impact that this process will have on noise, pollution, uh, earth excavation, you know, all this kind of, uh, it goes through the analysis of other, let's say, bureaucrats for the regional environmental agency, uh, from the uh, uh, monument protection superintendencies and so on, each one with its own specific field. And, and this is an, like another little innovation, I think that is worth uh, like taking as well, like this, like this sort of joint committee that approves, it's like one-stop shop for approval uh, of all uh, third parties approval. So you go through this procedure, it can be cumbersome sometimes, but normally within a year it's, it's done uh, in the recent project. And then it's really like, okay, there is noise, we will put noise barriers. There is this thing, so we can put this under the, uh, I mean, the regulation that established that. So it's not really, oh, dear public, we are showing you the 735 alternatives we can do and show you that we consider every possible thing so you can, will not sue us in the future for not considering everything. There is not this uh, element, much, much less. I think this is one of the main, difference. Um, maybe I can also mention a few things about how it is in Istanbul, and I think it's kind of similar to um, Italy. Um, I mean, in generally Turkey too, there is little opposition um, for to while building um, public transit or rail construction. Um, the environmental assessment processes are also expedited, like there, there is a standard a waiver uh, actually process because the projects are considered to have a net positive effect. Um, and there's little, really like there's almost no nimbyism um, for, for um, transit uh, construction projects. One thing though that makes land acquisition um, can be an issue, uh, but the agencies prefer to um, do that, have the alignments go through areas that are owned by the um, government or where they don't expect conflict. So if they have to buy land, they buy it from the owners at, land, at market value. Uh, and if not, they really don't want to go through the whole um, court process. So they design alignments that way, in which case, you know, sometimes they're not designed for the, uh, you know, optimum um, use. Um, and one other thing that makes it easier for um, Turkey is the governance structure is much less fragmented compared to, for example, the states. So usually the, the municipal, the city or the state, they own the land, like they, they can use a park, for example, to uh, set, up, set up a staging um, area during construction, or they can locate uh, entrances and exits and um, right, roadside, uh, so they don't have to deal with the third party or another agency. The city can just, you know, decide and do it that way. So that makes it um, easier for Istanbul to uh, build jail. Um, and one thing I wanted to, to ask about, about Turkey and Istanbul in particular, too, is that, you know, often, um, obviously, we criticize a lot of um, bloated costs in other countries. Um, but in some sense, we are also paying for things, right? Like, I know you mentioned in your um, case study, like, there's not a lot of labor protections in, um, in uh, Istanbul and Turkey. And so, you know, and that you know contributes to lower labor costs like how much of that is like the large is a large driver of lower costs and is there sort of this um recognition at the local level that that is trading off with um uh with with increased um better project timelines and lower cost overruns um so in our study in general we find that labor is not necessarily like labor costs is not necessarily that big part of the picture although they are very expensive uh, in the US, still that, that's not the main thing. Um, but also we see that, so yeah, that, that's um, kind of like the, one of the negatives uh, we learned from Istanbul, like the, um, the workers are not unionized, the uh, labor conditions are not that great. They are improving, um, but, but they're not great. But another thing we see about uh, regarding labor is that the efficiency is really high. Um, so for example, um, in Istanbul, um, 
like um, half the amount of half the number of laborers or one fourth the amount of laborers can build um, like twice a longer amount of rail within the same time as uh, New York. So it's like the efficiency um, is like eight times more. So that's that's an important factor. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's we do see some uh, issues in that sense um, where there's still uh, room for improvement. Yeah, um, I, I, maybe I didn't answer like no, that. that was answer great. question. <laughs> No, that was exactly right. And, and can you talk a little bit more broadly about other input costs and, and what kinds of things are driving differences then? Yeah, um, so the because of competition, because there are so many contractors that bid for projects, the costs go as low as they can go. Uh, so we have the uh, reference price list as well, and um, the tender documents already give the contractors the list of uh, items uh, that we involved in construction, so everybody kind of kind of knows the base price, and then the contractors start to go under it to bid for uh, tenders because they're like, you have a twenty kilometer rail project tendered out, and then you have ten or like twelve contractors bidding for it, which is like unseen in uh, in the U.S. If you have like three bidders, it's it's great uh, in New York, for example. So that really lowers the cost. The contractors begin to try to innovate, to um, you know, find ways to build things for cheaper. They because also because there is always ongoing construction and they know that there'll be a project, like if they don't get this one, they'll get the next one. They invest in their um, in technology and in their uh, equipment pools, for example. Contractor own contractors own TBMs in Istanbul and um, always this um, specific um, diameter, the 6.3 external diameter TBMs are used so that um, you know, people already have them so they can utilize, utilize them in um, projects. So that's um, also another thing that uh, brings down the costs. Uh, maybe one of the um, points I can make is, I've kind of mentioned the, this uh, flexible approach. Um, but also there's flexibility in um, changes, uh, in uh, accommodating changes. And so even though the um, agency goes to the construction tender with a 60% design document, they're willing to make changes on it as long as the construction manager approves and as long as they believe that it will uh, save time and save costs and it will be better for the project. Um, both them and the contractors are willing to uh, accommodate these changes. Like, for example, they can change um, a building method from uh, NATM to TBM or, or um, the other way if they believe that it will be better, or if they, they can change the design of the station, for example, change the locations of, of the entrances or exits, even, even after the construction starts at some inst instances. Uh, so that really helps bring down the um, cost as well. Uh, and all of this uh, kind of helps speed up things. So speed is a big thing in Istanbul, like to avoid delays, they do everything because they know that every day will uh, add costs. And maybe I know I spoke a lot, but um, one last thing, um, the costs are locked in with the contract. So there's only allowance for a 20% cost increase. And if you go above that, it has to go uh, to the cabinet of ministers for approval and it takes really long. So that's avoided at all costs. Um, in like worst case scenarios, the contractors will um, make an agreement with the agency and just finish the part that they can with the given budget. Um, and then the rest of the um, work is contract like tendered again. So there is a, a big, that's a big incentive to uh, stick to the uh, contract costs and uh, budgets and not go um, higher than 20%. Yeah, and, and um, that was very interesting. And, and one follow-up is just, um, I know you mentioned in your um, case study that um, contractor, there's there's still a ton of turn within contractors in um, in the uh, uh, in Turkey, but is, is, is the reason why that doesn't lead to loss of institutional knowledge just because of so much competition um, or is it just most of the knowledge kind of being held by the state? Like what's going on there? 
Um, so the, the, the local government, the municipality until 2019 had been the same for um, 10 years or longer, I think. So there was this capacity building there. But I think most of the knowledge is um, sustained in the industry, like within the contractors and consultants, because there's so much rail building going on. And it has also mostly been in Istanbul. So it's also been very localized. Like um, you, you had designers, engineers, you had uh, contractors that had been building rail for the last 20 years. So, and they were always, there were always work so um, the knowledge uh, stayed there and during this time the agency also um, learned from them and from uh, their own experience um, now the since the central government is now the ministry of transit is also building a lot in istanbul um, they're um, benefiting from this um, collective knowledge and they are also hiring staff from the um, central government so um, so it's it kind of like stays in the system and uh, and when new rail um, is built in other cities, I believe they also benefit from this and um, they have all these contractors, subcontractors, designers to, you know, pool of knowledge to draw from. Um, and Marco, can you talk to us a little bit about uh, input costs in Italy and, and what you see there, the variation? I mean, Italy is somehow in between the US and Turkey for input costs, in the sense that labor costs are higher. Uh, let's say if you say, I don't know, France is 100, Italy is 80, the United States are 140 maybe, uh, Spain is 50 and Turkey is maybe 40 or something like that. I'm just like giving an idea. And especially the, the thing that really, I mean, in Italy, there has been a lot of, and still the costs are high. And the, for example, labor represents some, depending on the kind of, from a sample of contracts we have seen, because when there is procurement, they, they state the percentage of labor. It's part of this transparency of the procurement. And it's between 18 and 32, what I've seen. Depends on the matter of uh, work that is done, if it's more mechanized or less and so on. So uh, one thing is really that, for example, uh, it's not just the input cost, for example, for uh, uh, professional services are lower in Italy. Uh, I'm pretty sure that the amount of paper that uh, uh, an Italian agency or contractors or uh, whatever produce for a comparable project in Italy or in the US is way, way, way less. I mean, there are a lot of pre-studies and re-studies and a lot of this uh, public participation that goes for uh, 300 meetings, everyone of, with five hours with professionals that are paid $250 per hour, you can jump very quickly to cost. Then you have like a, a forecast for the environmental impact uh, review of the uh, Link 21 in, uh, and uh, in California, it's 1 billion. I mean, that's what cost across just 1 billion in people doing like studies and so on and like moving paper, let's say. And uh, this is really something I've been, mean, maybe in Italy they are too low, uh, to be honest. and. Um, one thing that has been studied is like, uh, I mean, safety can be improved, I think always. Uh, safety in public works is better than in private works in Italy in, gen in general. And one thing is that, for example, the amount of money for safety, it's out of the contract. It's pre-established, it's fixed. It's under the supervision of a third party uh, supervisor that is like the manager of the safety that is, not, that is not hired by the constructor, by the contractor is under the, uh, uh, project owner, sorry. And it's really, I mean, it's, it's, it's been a strategy to try to solve one problem that is like a lot of subcontracting and opaqueness that exist, existed and still exists, unfortunately. And as you can imagine, mafia infiltration in some of the specific uh, uh, contracts. So, I mean, it's, it's an issue, but one thing, for example, that I, my impression is that for how unions work in Italy, so it, it, Italian workers are unionized, but there is like a general national bargain. So the cost of labor is known. And for example, there are not micro sectoral organizations. There is a wide broad organization for construction worker. Uh, there are like specific figures that get like higher pays because they are like working like pilot of TBNs or things like that. And for example, like even talking with contractors that have been working abroad, one of the main problems in North America is 
over segmentation of uh, unions, not just to, because of the pays. It's a lot of rules about who can do what. And in Europe, essentially, you have like an, a system of uh, certification. So this person did the uh, formation to work in a specific environment with specific equipment. So they can work on this. So they have the security uh, capacity to work with this. In the US is a lot of, uh, I mean, Eric will tell you much more in the future about New York. There's a lot of this over fragmentation, but this is the case in part in Canada too. And another thing is really that my impression, but this would need like further research, is that Italy has pushed uh, uh, prefabrication and uh, uh, cost uh, labor cost saving uh, techniques much further than the US. Like less false works, less uh, uh, things cast in place. In many, many aspects, there is a more innovation within the construction sector of uh, uh, having techniques that saves you money and labor uh, while doing the same thing, like uh, digging under a street or doing things like that. Eric, uh, Eric, what do you and Alan too? Uh, what do you what do you all think about the um, uh, uh, the labor productivity issues in the United States? Like, where are those stemming from? Given that um, these other countries have been able to to advance so much more. Yeah, so, so I was going to say that in Sweden, I can't give you exact comparisons, and the reason I can't give you exact comparison is that um, Stockholm uses a different construction te technique from everyone else. Um, but um, qualitatively, uh, they are incredibly uh, parsimonious with labor because the wages are incredibly high. So um, in New York, they're called sand hogs, the workers in the tunnels. In Sweden, they're just called miners. They're, they're often hired from among people who are, let's say, iron miners or something. Uh, and uh, they, and, and what I was told is that they earn, I want to say 70,000 kroner a month. That's, you put it through the PPP calculator, it's going to be about $90,000 a year. That's before taxes and Swedish, and Swedish taxes are high. But a lot of the taxes are levied employer side, and they, um, and, and the benefits double you. So the um, cost to their employer is about twice the, the figure that I just told you because of um, social benefits, because of overheads, because of um, worker housing. This is really important, and uh, a rather big difference is that in the United States, the labor for this is very local. Uh, so New York City sand hogs tend to be third, fourth, fifth generation Irish. Um, they live either in the city in like their specific neighborhoods or in specific suburbs of the city. Um, that's not how it works around here. Um, the labor pool is pan-EU um, or even broader than that. Um, not a single one of the miners in the, for, for, for Nürte Nürbanen in Stockholm lives in Stockholm. I mean, they're working in Stockholm, they're getting temporary housing and this um, drives up the cost because they do need to provide them with, with, with pretty good housing. Um, but then they're gonna go back to wherever they're from, which could be in more provincial parts of Sweden, it could be in Finland, Slovakia. Um, it's, um, and so, so what they do is they, um, they just figure out how to increase construction productivity. One of the things that they've been most worried about in Sweden, and this has been leading them to change, in my opinion, for the worse, the, the, a lot of their construction techniques, not construction, the procurement techniques, is they're complaining that um, over the last few decades, the growth in productivity, in labor productivity, in construction economy-wide has only been 0.8% a year. Now, here's the thing. The United States, as far as I can tell, you might actually know the statisticians better than I do at this point, Labor productivity and construction in the United States is falling. It's lower now, I believe, or maybe, or maybe it's flat. I, I, I believe that. I, I believe it's actually deteriorated in the last forty years. Um, so that's an economy. So, so that so that would be economy wide. I mean, the, the, the construction costs for buildings are much higher in, in the United States and in Europe. Um, I don't quite know why. I mean, I, I read art. I mean, I read articles about this same places th th that you do, and in general media and things, that, or in financial media and what they, um, and what the reference. I don't have a good fundamental explanation. 
Um, I mean, I mean, there, there are complaints about uh, the decline of manufactured homes, but that was, I, I believe, a one-time thing in the seventies or something. Um, yeah, there's not great research on this, but I, I guess like one of my one of my like good theories is just that this is downstream of just lack of um, like a really competitive, vibrant environment where there's a lot of um, you know similarly when when it's going on in, in in Istanbul, for instance, you're building a lot and there's a ton of incentive for firms to be both low cost and high value to the government and. That includes improving labor productivity. That's obviously true in Italy, where you have also these like larger constraints where you're trying to deal with geographic variation, you're trying to deal with um, historic preservation, and you have to be really nimble with it because the goal is not just to appease NIMBYs, it's to literally preserve something historical and figure out a way to be innovative. And there's like not that I feel like goal in the American sector. So Eric, I don't know what you think about that. The only other thing I would add is, is one in talking to cost estimators in the states. There's variation, you know, in in our country. The Northeast being known for having very low sort of production rates on on at least transit projects. Um, but the other thing I'd add is uh, that we've seen is that both in Spain and in Italy and in in Turkey, sort of just construction shifts. The hours that people work are different, right? So in New York, it's you know eight hour shifts, and so laborers are often an hour or two is lost to getting to the site, setting up, cleaning up, breaking it down, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so when you have a longer shift, um, it eats away a smaller percentage of um, each shift, right? So if you lose two hours every eight hours rather than every 12 hours, you know, you, you, you can see how the productivity declines. Um, and the other thing is just sort of um, in appeasing, you know, NIMBYs or whatever, whoever you're trying to appease, you know, we make decisions uh, here in the States to be sort of a quote unquote good neighbor that sort of make it difficult to do stuff, right? Like we won't shut down traffic um, when we're trying to build a subway station where you, when I, I, one of my favorite things about looking at both these cases in Istanbul and in Italy is just doing the Google image search um, or Google maps and then looking at the historical images of where construction takes place. And you see just like, you know, fences and it's, it's shut down. Um, in New York, like I, I've sent, you know, Marco and LF, you know, all these pictures of just like traffic zooming past like where they're doing, you know, intensive construction uh, here in the States. And, you know, that's, you know, those extra safety measures slow things down. I was talking to someone the other day that said, um, you know, they had to maintain I think, three or four lanes of traffic for a project. And if they could have just shut down the whole thing, they could have built it, you know, twice as fast. Um, and, you know, there's a cost benefit, right? You have to do, you know, just shutting down everything maybe is not appropriate, but like, we don't even have those discussions oftentimes. Like, um, I think, that's where public participation is interesting is sort of proposing some trade-offs and being like, we could do this and spend this much time and this much money, or we can do that and spend this much time and this much money, which solution is better. And from my perspective, and, you know, as, you know, a big raging American, um, I think, you know, like that's where we can say, okay, it's worth spending extra amount of money to like, never have my taxi or my delivery truck be delayed. I mean, I wouldn't agree with that, but like, that's a discussion to have. Um, like arguing about, you know, I, I, you know, whether the entrance should be here or there is important, but I think much less important than some of these like construction staging, phasing, and sort of like scope of project uh, debates that perhaps we should be having. Yeah, and uh, so, so in San Jose, it's actually a, big thing that's happening right now because they decided to use um a certain method to build the subway there for for bart um using which is um a large diameter board so north so basically everywhere and again my case stockholm is a weird exception the way subways are built is you take a tunneling machine you dig two holes uh deep underground one for each track and then you uh build the stations in between top-down. Um, San Jose uses a method that is, instead of doing that, you build, you do one large diameter bore. Um, so you can put both tracks in one bore. And moreover, uh, you can even stagger the track so you can even have the platform within the same bore. Um, it is a method that is used in Barcelona on line nine. This is the most expensive project 
per kilometer in Spain by a pretty large margin, which means that it is only something like 180, 190, maybe today's money would be like $200 million a kilometer, and most other things in Spain are 100 ish. Um, and it's essentially only ever used when you need to go underneath a lot of older subway lines. It is not, it is not going to help you with um, archaeological stuff. The, uh, something that Marco told us a while ago is that the looked into it in Rome and figured that it would demolish archaeological monuments. Um, it's, you, um, you never ever use it for your first subway because why would you do that? You can build cut and cover stations very easily. San Jose chose that method because some small business owners complained that if there was any surface disruption ever, it would destroy their businesses. And they complained about something related to a light rail line that uh, uh, caused a lot of disruption to traffic. And so they just decided, OK, let's do a very large bore. Uh, and the, and the cost, they think of the subway or something like at this point, a billion dollars a kilometer, which has to be a pretty big margin, the most expensive first subway in the city. Um, um, so, so, so definitely the, the issue with, of disruption is something that agencies need to be a lot more aggressive about, I think, and tell business owners, no. Um, well, I think I've exhibited a lot of restraint not making this whole thing about NIMBYs, but um, uh, I would love to, to turn to public participation now. So Marco, how, how does public participation really work in Italy? How much of a role is there for regular citizens to either insert themselves into the process or um, methods for businesses or community groups? Is that even a culture in, in, in the state? Well, uh, I mean, it's, it's for sure different. Let's say that has been, I mean, we, we have been talking about public participation in Italy since the 80s. There has been some kind of it. We have been back and forth for having more or less or having some sort of more tokenism kind of approach to public participation. Uh, the thing is, I think what is very different is that, I mean, project ownership, because of cost constraints and a different approach to uh, and even the lack of, lack of resources at a certain point, they are less eager to accommodate everything. Don't think in Italy there are not people chained to trees because trees have been cut or uh, shopkeepers uh, showing up because they don't want disruption going on for uh, like four uh, months, uh, for month, five months, five years, five, six years in front of them. I mean, in Milan for M4 central section, they shut down completely a street because it was the only place to put the station because there was not much uh, more place and in general this happens in many places but for example it doesn't matter if if to avoid like if the approach is no disruption at all and if you have to dig this huge cavern station with just access shaft on the side instead of the much cheaper cut and cover box that is typical as the cheapest approach when you use bore tunnels uh, of course it will cost more and if you want to uh, work in uh, constrained working windows, as, uh, as Eric was saying, it costs more. I mean, how much a system, I, I really can't compare everything, but my impression is really the Italian system is less, for many reasons, less eager or less capable to accommodate all of this. I mean, we simply rule out a construction of a project and we are seeing this in Rome where like there is a sort, I mean, for techno, protection of monument can be considered a sort of institutionalized limby in a way because they have a veto power over everything and the fact they are going very deep and very uh, uh, to avoid I mean to avoid disruption on the surface to avoid the archaeological level to avoid any possible risk of damages to monuments and churches and whatever you have on the uh, surface this is a rising cost I mean it's I think it's important because as a researcher we can say we cannot say to people what you have to do but we can point out to people, of course, if you want a, an underground cathedral, you want an open space over your truck, so you don't use this space to put all the technical rooms that you need, and you have to dig further, bigger volumes because you want to have this nice open uh, uh, mezzanine. It's more space. I mean, it's, uh, it's, uh, the, this is physics, it's not politics. But it's politics is involved because if you want a, a nicer state, if you go and see Milan station, they are small, uh, a bit cramped, they feel really, but they are building, they've been built like 25 kilometers more and they are like 15, 17 kilometers more in the pipeline in the future. So 
we have to understand where is the trade-off. And I think it's a conversation worth having because of a lot of projects that are going out of budget and we are getting so little out of so many bucks put on it in the United States and in Canada too. And um, what about what about Turkey? How does public participation work um, in Istanbul? Um, so I should say there's not a big culture of um, public engagement um, efforts. Um, the part of the environmental assessment process is having some public engagement meetings uh, to um, I mean, mostly promote the project and raise some awareness. Uh, but other than that, we don't really see that much opposition, um, at least for transportation projects. If it was a park, for example, a tree, it's, it's different uh, you know, from the history of uh, Istanbul. Uh, but for public transit, most people are willing to, um, they're, you know, they, they understand the trade-offs. Uh, for local um, store or owners or um, like residents living in the areas, I guess um, like there is even, even if there is some opposition, people uh, kind of like believe in the states will or um, like they're they're some of them still of course, but it's it's never a it's never a big deal, and um, you know mostly people are willing to bear the um, costs of like having transit uh, like public transit come to them and usually people are excited that their land are, is going to gain value so there's also the culture of like there are a lot of rail enthusiasts their websites like people start following the um the schedule of construction they even start like following the news years before a project starts being built so it's kind of like, it's, it's not very, like it, it doesn't um, constrain, constrain construction as much as it does elsewhere, especially like it does in the US. Yeah, I mean, one of the big costs of um, NIMBYism and uh, not just NIMBYism, but I also think that like uh, the uh, atomization of the process where there are just so many people trying to put their hands in the pot of different construction projects is that you get a ton of like weird customization and specifications going on is there's obviously I know I think both of your cases mentioned that there's like like a lot more standardization of what is uh, um, uh, what is being built and do you view that as sort of downstream of the fact that like there's very clear like who owns the project and they're kind of making the decision there aren't the ability for either NIMBYs or other groups or political actors to kind of get involved um, or, or or you know how, how big of a deal is, is customization um, or the lack of customization in, in, and why has that happened in your um, states? Oh, sorry. Um, I, I guess I can jump in and say in Turkey, there's really not that much customization. And uh, the opposite, the streamlining and standardization of the designs, especially of stations, which we know that um, you know, station costs are a big part of the uh, bill. Um, so it's it's actually benefited the a lot to standardize and to simplify designs over time. And we see clearly um, from the projects that you know maybe built 20 years ago and today um, there's been a change in how uh, stations and even tunnels are designed now they're very streamlined and that way the costs have been brought down um, quite a lot and you know i think people are happy about it I, i've i've heard you know some some people say oh m2 which is like one of the earliest projects it was so you know the stations were so beautiful and like so they were uh, arts everywhere but you know look at the new ones however i think it's more valuable that um, you know they can be built faster and cheaper and they are very clean i should say like um also because they're new but they're very clean cut um the the materials are standardized the design um we, we've also seen like the technical spaces their locations like the way um their, their configurations their Pretty standardized, and that helps a lot with um, helps a lot uh, with bringing down the costs over time. In Sweden, they're in Sweden they're doing this thing where um, the stations are mostly standardized, but they still find ways to make them more artistic. The main way is again something very bespoke because they um, mine directly through very hard rock. They leave sections of the exposed rock 
um, and it's very pretty. Sometimes, I mean, or they can just do art installations. I mean, at the end of the day, paying an artist to make a nice sculpture does not cost a lot of money. And Marco? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely something. I mean, in Italy, you have both cases where you have like palatial, very one. I mean, they are beautiful. The stations in Naples are amazing, but I mean, it's worth, it's a choice, but you know, it will cost more. Finishing would be more costly. The volumes would be more uh, in, like impressive to build, like civil structures that goes along to civil structures. It's a, a big chunk of a station construction. But for example, really a station is a box essentially where people have to circulate from the surface to the platform and vice versa in normal situation. And in case of emergency, get out very quickly and not be hurt by smoke and fire. That's essentially what station need to, to do. Uh, place making and everything. Yes, we can add more scope on this, but this, if I can share like an image from, from the rapper, maybe people have already seen it, but it's really, you know, like this is Milan. You can see really the, the station on the uh, northern section, they are all the same and cost all the same or less with those small differences due to. Then the other section, a bit more differences because there are more interferences with other infrastructure, there is more water, but if you go to Naples, you see you can have a station that costs seven million, and you can have a station that costs one hundred eight million. And they are both station. Okay, the difference in the size of trains and everything, and well, this is Rome and so on. But you really see, like for example, city center station costing more. But where you have standardization, like in uh, in Turin, the case you have more or less the same cost everywhere, and where it's a bit higher, it's because there is ground water, ground, uh, water in the ground, and so on. I mean. Some specific condition you cannot abide are the rules of engagement, let's say, of how you're building. But in general, yes, the stations are bearable, let's say. Maybe they're not so special and people complain, ah, look, in Naples, they have this wonderful station. But at the same time, Naples is building much less than is, Milan is doing. And the percentage of people using transit in Milan is much higher than the one in Naples or in Rome, for example. So we have to decide what's our goal. I mean, it's, it's, we have to have a frank discussion if, I mean, this is, these are the, 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 uh, the thing on the table. I mean, standardization, it means like, if you talk to the people in Milan, uh, they, they, they can say, okay, we're now building uh, an extension of two station of the M4 line that we are finishing now. And what we take, we take the station and we translate and they are complaining because the new norms about fire prevention for them are changing a bit the design. But it's like taking a design and replicating it, it's something that saves a lot in terms of not starting every time from zero, because after all, I mean, th these people say it's mega projects, they are very complex, they are, but at the same time, it's two tracks with just boxes of station with two platforms and something to circulate up and down from the street level to the platform, that's it. It's not much more complex than that, if you think about it. And I know we've talked briefly about um, Turkey's how they deal with cost overruns, and if it if it, I think it's if it gets above is it twenty percent of the project cost, you it then gets sent back to another ministry. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And so, Marco, how do how do how do we deal with cost overruns in Italy? What happens then? Well, I mean, it's uh, I mean, what there are positive and negative things. I think this is still an unsolved or partially unsolved problem. The positive thing is that since all contracts are itemized contracts, they're not lump sum contracts, and uh, the contractors submit bids by line item. So you have these thousands of pages of how much the bid is submitted, and then there are change orders that happen in every project, no matter how good you do the design in the beginning, they can be quantified much easier based on that. So change orders, and in Turkey is exactly the same. I think this is the way to go. Then there is this kind of black hole of the compensable claims that is where really there is still an issue in Italy and one way to deal with this was to I mean the court of auditors the national anti-corruption authority say enough with contingencies contingencies should be low because otherwise they are inviting like for change orders and compensable claims and so on another thing is really that you have to have a strong enough supervision capacity, what is in Italy is called the direction of works. That is the one that supervises uh, like uh, accounting, billing, uh, tracking costs throughout the, uh, the project. So both on the side of the owner and on the contractor, there should be track of how much is spent is built like by the millimeter of uh, uh, track laid down. 
And the other thing is that the problem is really in Italy, that there is this principle that, for example, if the contractor is not put in the condition of doing its work properly, so it, it needs to be compensated because this reference price are referred to an ideal situation in which the contractor can use uh, its own resources in the best way. But for example, if the TBM is altered for months, as it happened in Rome, because of uh, archaeological findings, uh, political uncertainty in over whether to continue the line and other kind of stuff, of course, the uh, contractor can and should go and say, okay, I, I'm not using my TBM, I have to pay uh, salaries and so on. The problem is that how you quantify this, this is still a very uh, tricky part. And it's, where it's, it's really where the contractors are getting to get some more profit, extra profit, because it's very hard and, you know, they can always uh, like uh, threaten to stop construction or halt if they are not compensated throughout. Rome has had a lot of these issues also because of the structure of the contract. Uh, they did like design build contract they did. I mean, it's, it's not completely solved, but the, the good part is that the extra amount normally you see for very complex projects like uh, Rome and so on, it's in the eight, nine, 10% of the contract. And in like easier projects like tramways and so on, like uh, in Florence was 1.7%. So it's still very marginal within the uh, budget. And one thing that I've been told is really to have this direction of work and the RUP, that is the uh, like chief manager of the project, like let's say, that is a public official this is in charge of like controlling everything in the project it has to be a tough person that says a lot of no 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 he says i i say just no at the beginning and i keep saying no and then we go for a like some kind of agreement at the end um i also wanted to ask uh, both of you about how um you know if you had to explain internal variation um of costs what is mostly driving that inside of your country? I mean, I know um, in Turkey, for instance, you kind of talk about how, um, you know, you, you go through the case studies of different um, uh, projects and a lot of it, it's like the learning curve. So the earlier ones are, are more expensive, but can you kind of go over kind of now um, for, for things that are happening in this, you know, last few years or so, what is the big drivers of internal variation? Um, sure. Um, so I guess, like, there is some, we've also had our share of um, corruption or um, some meddling in the tender processes. For example, usually we see that, um, so the, the agency makes an estimate based on itemized costs. It's not, um, not revealed before the tender, but usually the bids of contractors will go below that estimate because there's competition. But we have seen for a bunch of projects uh, that were tendered on the same, same day on, in 2017, that all bids were um, maybe like 10, 15% um, higher than the estimates. And it's, uh, we also have the, have the table in the um, case, but there we know like it's obvious and it's also known in the um, industry that there was corruption there like <clears throat> so that significantly brought up the cost because otherwise the competition built into the system doesn't really allow that um, and <clears throat> there are other instances of where um, like the tender process was changed a bit a law was added um, so that um, <clears throat> things could be turned out much faster and um, without a, an a RFQ process. So these things usually um, change the uh, costs um, a lot. And other than that, it's um, the ground conditions, the density of areas where the uh, line is going to pass through. Um, we have two different capacities. Uh, usually uh, we have the east-west uh, lines that are um, like double the capacity of the north-south um, uh, lines. So those have much bigger stations, uh, much larger platforms. So they tend to be more expensive. Um, and also delays when that happen can, you know, the, the instance where I talked about going over this 20% where the contractor 
just terminates their contract, finishes what they can in agreement with the agency, of course, and then it's tended again. Um, that has to do either with um, kind of like not very, not, not a really good preliminary planning and design process. If that happens and if the changes are really drastic, then there are all these costs and accounted for in the beginning. And also there are sometimes funding issues um, which happened in um, 2018. There was an economic crisis and we're still in it actually. Uh, but at that time, the municipality couldn't pay the contractors in a timely manner. So uh, almost all construction stopped uh, uh, for these five lines. Currently, like we don't know if their costs will because they're still in construction, and we don't we haven't heard of the you know where the costs will go. But likely because there was such a long delay, um, where the contractors didn't do much work, there will be uh, cost increases. And Marco, same question about internal variation. I mean, there are things that like internal variation, like the characteristic of the area you're building, your uh, or even of the object you're building. I mean, light tray, light subways, where uh, like metro with the short platforms, and uh, uh, compared to like, uh, I mean, in Italy you have like MB in Rome that has 150 meters long platform, more similar to what you have in North America, and then you have like this very tiny that some people. Uh, called horizontal elevators, but they moves more than many high EV metro in the United States, uh, like this 50, 50 or even 40 meters, like in Brescia long platforms. Um, but the thing is really, this is like inherent to the project, to the demand you have, to the approach you decided to use and to the context. I mean, in Italy, it will always be more expensive to build in city centers than outside. This is given. Or in some cities that have poor geology compared to others and uh, this kind of stuff. There are things that can be put on, on, under control. I mean, the, for example, the design build scheme used in Naples that is sort of heritage of this very dark era from the 70s, 80s of opacity and uh, lack of competition. It is believed uh, it's hard to quantify it for 10% or 15% or 20% of the cost, but it's part of the reason why this um, this subway ended up to be the, the most expensive in Italy uh, ever built, this particular center section. Uh, so it's kind of, uh, I think also Elif used this uh, uh, term in, uh, in our case, like the perfect store. The problem is that with cost, you have a lot of things that overlaps and sometimes one thing trigger another. So you have some kind of reinforcement of cycles. So for example, I mean, if you already have like low labor costs in your country and specific things, it's easier to, to take in more uh, problems from other factors, more additional costs. But in places like the United States that have very high cost of labor, for example, every like minimal change or over specification or over design or some kind of uh, uh, less than ideal procurement practice can blow cost like uh, very quickly. So I think it's in general, if in procurement, uh, what we can say it's uh, there is a, a sort of ideal spot that is not very easy to find where you have enough detailed design to know what you are procuring and to be out with a specific headline cost to say, we are going to procure this. There might be some changes, but this is our project. So let's say uh, these percentages are very, I mean, it can be between 70, 60 and 80 or 90%. Uh, or you can go with, but you want to leave some room for the contractor to innovate to bring a different construction technique or to, div, uh, to bring a machine to lay tracks faster or some other kind of a specification that are equivalent. So you can say, okay, I'm, I'm good at this. I will take five months instead of six and it will cost 10% less, but the characteristic in terms of performance are the same. So you want to have this kind of balance and I wouldn't say that it's perfect and so on, but I think the approach that is going, it's became the norm in Italy of the best value for money approach. So 80% scoring or 70 and 20, 30% cost. In, in Italy, the, the bids comes normally recently between six, seven, five, three percent under the bidding threshold that is known, that is set using this reference price so bid that are kind of upper threshold for bidding. And so, and like contractors win on technical scoring. In most of the pro recent projects that I've seen, it's rarely the one that bids the lowest price that win the contract. So this is really 
how do you find this sweet spot? You have to have the capacity of evaluating the bidders. You have to have the structure to, uh, procurement is a very, I mean, people that uh, maybe are, uh, are listening, they know very well, some of them, how complicated it is to go through a procurement without making any false step. So I think, but this is a very important thing, I think, for having this kind of internal variation. Sometimes depends on the capacity of having a good procurement with the right tools and the right capacity of supervising what goes into procurement, what you receive as a bid, and so on and so on. Um, okay, so before we turn to maybe some audience questions, I wanna do a, just a round robin and have everyone kind of say um, what they think the most important takeaways are from outsiders of these countries about the success Italy and um, Istanbul have had in building so much transit. So if there's like a, just a couple of things that you would want folks to take away that you think other countries should either model or consider um, in their own projects, um, I think that we, we should we should go there. So um, I guess, Alan, let's start with you. So just for um, just for uh, the takeaway, I think people need to stop looking down on certain places um, because in so, so where I live in Germany, if you tell people that Italy does good engineering, they will um, And certainly they will laugh if you tell them that Turkey does good engineering. I suspect that in Italy too, people will laugh if you tell them Turkey does good engineering. Um, and I have this suspicion, it's kind, of, it's kind of suspicion in the back of my mind that the reason the Anglosphere has the worst cost in the world in the United States within the Anglosphere and New York within the Anglosphere, within New York, within the United States, is that if it were the other way around, the more peripheral places would have learned. Like, Italy is learning a lot from the, uh, Germany in the things that Germany does better than Italy. For example, rail operations in Northern Europe are much better than in Southern Europe. Um, so, and, and, and people in Italy understand it. I mean, the planners in Italy understand, understand it and are starting to implement German uh, timetabling, for example. Um, and Spain grabbed a few German things when it was building high-speed rail and now it is starting to understand how screwed up its operations are is the um, same thing. Uh, but in the other direction, it's not happening. In the other direction, there's very little interest in Northern Europe and learning from Southern Europe. There is, in theory, some interest in the United States and learning from Europe, but that mostly boils down to taking some practices from London and adopting them. And London is the most expensive place to build in, in Europe. Uh, if it's not London, then it's Moscow. Like, um, I think London and Moscow are the worst in, in different ways. And, um, and, and so it's really, and, and I see in my, in, my, in my Sweden research, I, I was reading all these reports about how to make um, Swedish construction more effective. And they constantly were looking, to, were looking up to Britain and the Netherlands. At no point during any of that was there any reference to a place that was not in Northern Europe. Um, and you see this in New York too, and everything is excuses. Oh, well, we're a better city than whatever. We're a bigger city than whatever. We're a richer city than whatever. What do we in New Yorkers have to learn from literally anyone who's not maybe, maybe possibly potentially London or Paris? Um, so, so that's my, my, my big thing um, with these cases. Eric? No, I'm going to jump in. I, I don't completely agree with Alan's assessment there. I, I know that for Second Avenue Subway, for instance, the stations were very much modeled off of Asian cities that were, were building big, large, massive stations, uh, primarily in Singapore and um, a couple other, uh, Hong Kong as well. Um, but I, Alan is not wrong about some of the, the other points. Um, but I think, I think that the big thing, right, is that stations are really expensive um, and moving slowly is really expensive. And so if we, understand those two things, um, we should be able to make decisions that, you know, move things along more quickly if we want to have lower cost projects. And we need to, yeah, think about, well, do we need to have, as sort of Marco has mentioned, a station with a full length mezzanine um, that then you have to cut a bigger box to fit in all the technical rooms and things like that? Because underground construction is expensive. Um, and when you 
in, you know, interact that with high labor costs, you know, labor intensive processes that are slow moving with high labor are going to be very expensive. And I think that that just fundamentally understanding that relationship at the outset is really important. Um, and then the last thing, I, I do think internal expertise um, is just enormously important. I think one thing that would be really interesting in the US is if you had something like the Army Corps of Engineers, um, you know, looking at some of these domestic infrastructure projects, um, you know, helping out a Kansas City, you know, learning some stuff, you know, helping out a New York City um, and participating across the country and helping to build, you know, projects in a more standardized fashion, obviously, you know, sensitive to um, whatever, you know, context uh, is relevant. Um, and I think that what we what we do see is that there's this movement away from that kind of expertise. It's more about let's farm things out to our consultants. And, you know, the consultants that I talk to, they often say, well, then the client doesn't necessarily know what it is that they want. And if you don't know what you want, you can't really have a good preliminary design and you're open to making changes. And I think the key on the preliminary design specificity is not so much, okay, there's going to be a line here, but it's like, the stations are going to be here and the stations are going to be of this size. And this is going to be, you know, the number of tiles that are going to be there. Like having some of that detail is, is quite important for, you know, fixing the, you know, the range of the, of the final cost. If you don't know some of those details, you know, you're just sort of uh, stabbing in the dark. Um, so I think, you know, those sort of three things are, 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 are very important. Um, Ellen? Um, yeah, maybe I can add to that. Uh, pre so preliminary design, planning and design process, it's the establishment kind of like speed mining um, and you know how it's evolved over the years has benefited Istanbul a lot. As I was saying that, you know, 60% design document really gives the agency a lot of insight into what they're dealing with so they can manage the whole process efficiently, but also combined with it, this flexibility of being opening to design changes later, because um, Istanbul doesn't actually do a design bid build, it's a design build, meaning, okay, that, in, that uh, initial design document is there, but also the contractor will come with their own designer and work on the project once again. So um, both having that and then kind of not taking it as a like project, something that's like, set in stone, but being open to change and innovation, um, you know, especially in terms of the design is, I think, um, very, I mean, it has been proved to be useful um, in Istanbul. Yeah. Marco, close to yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, like to, to continue from what Eric was saying, if there are like two big, uh, oh, sorry, I have, uh, yes. Sorry. Um, the, the thing is really there are two issues that is like about transparency and knowledge. Italy hasn't always been a transparent country like for governance and so on, but there has been a lot of effort to put much more transparency in general that is really linked about the idea of sharing knowledge. And what circling back to the question of state capacity, I mean state capacity is like now the uh, municipal in-house agency of Turin that is going to build the second line and the extension of the first line. They are building a BIM model because this is what the law requires now, but it's not just a model. They are building inside the model all the utilities and they will keep a sort of BIM model of cities infrastructure in general that will be kept updated for the future. So they are taking the occasion of having money to build this BIM, not just to like do their own thing and then ah, this is our thing. Like there is not this idea of every single agency and part being a little fortress and everyone throwing stone at the other fortress as sometimes we see in uh, in Canada or in uh, the United States. And the other thing is still this thing of capacity. I think this the case of Metropolitana Milanese, but there are others in Italy, but this is just the oldest and more continuous and the most successful. Rome had something like that, but they had more issues because of lower political commitment. There is this uh, will among the political class to put in places that works, they shelter these uh, agencies from attack. They keep them, they nurture them. When they are in a sort of danger, they put them like, for example, Metropolitana Milanese has seen a slowdown of uh, projects in the 90s. So they kind of stuff it up them to be also the company that takes care of uh, uh, social housing, municipal social housing, uh, all the engineering, like the water system, a lot of matter like to, be, to build a, a big like uh, municipal uh, sewage 
thing operating arm. And I think it's very important because, I mean, because this idea of knowledge is exactly that. You have people that have been doing stuff for so much time that they know what are the issues, that they know if they build this room uh, three meters wider, maybe it costs more, but it's easier than to fill equipment. So they sell money. Uh, so at this in no book, there is no book that will tell you that. There is, there is, it's built in in a private company, engineering firm, but it's, if it's built within uh, a publicly owned company whose purpose and goal is not to make money, but at least to preserve broadly the interest of the public, I think this is some lesson that can be learned from Italy, if, if there is any. <laughs> Yeah, I think the, the broad thing I'm taking away from all of this is just, you know, uh, there's a tendency, I, I feel, within um, the North American context to um, focus so much on all the challenges that feel insurmountable. Like there's a geographic challenge, like how do we do historic preservation, environmental, and what these cases really showcase is there are ways to deal with this and that there's actually a lot to do on the institutional policy design side to and where you can still protect the, 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 the specific nature of the concern you might have locally and politically, but with still building at a much lower cost. So um, I think that these cases are, are really in, um, instructive. So thank you both, all of you, for doing this work. Um, if Alan, I can, I'm sorry. I, oh, no, go sorry, on. I don't want to interrupt. It's, it's just something that it came to my mind. And because I sometimes I feel when you talk with people in agencies that we are blaming them for not being good enough, for not being... And I, I think it's really important. One thing that the Italian case could show it's a systemic issue. If it has to be treated as a systemic issue, you need legislative reforms of how procurement is done, giving power to the right bodies to be able to leverage their power, their knowledge to do this kind of process. Uh, I mean, you cannot ask agencies to go around this, the SICA, the, the Environmental Impact Review. You have to change it in national. Uh, like federal or whatever is the competence. In, in Canada, provinces have a lot of power. It's their duty to make the necessary reform to make agencies able to do their job. I think this is very important because otherwise it's just blaming each other and then keeping on with it. Sorry for interrupting. Yeah. No, great point. Um, Eric, Alan, do either of you want to um, turn to a couple of questions from the audience? I know, Alan, you've been kind of answering them in the comments, but if there's anything you want to pull out. I think the questions that I've seen in chat are, are, are honestly the one that I thought was one most pertinent. I think you already asked, I'm not sure whether you were staring at chat or if it was already on your list about historic uh, preservation. Um, oh, uh, Daniel, um, you're asking about uh, to what extent is keeping auxiliary expenses such as uh, fixing up utilities and road maintenance of the books, important for keeping transit infrastructure project budgets low. Um, so it depends on the project. And the reason that we're looking at subways and not at tramways is that this question makes it too difficult to compare headline costs of tramways. Um, because of things like uh, a lot of street reconstruction that is bundled with tramway costs. For example, the Nice tramway, uh, the, the first line of it, I believe was at the time the most expensive in provincial France per kilometer. I think it was at the time 40, $50 million. We've been maybe 10, 15 years ago. And um, so that line, 30% uh, of that budget was not on the line itself, but on extras, they're called betterments in uh in the united states and they're actually pretty big uh extra in boston for for our boston case for the green line extension um for subways these exist as well uh but they're much less important just because tree planting costs the same it doesn't matter if you build a tramway or a subway the tramway if you strip away all the extras is 30 million dollars a kilometer the subway if you strip off all the extras is, let's say 200 million so, um, so, so, so in practice, um, these extra costs don't matter very much for subways. Um, I just want to add to that briefly because um, it, it depends on, on the city and it depends on some of the, the regulations. So for using the example of New York, they narrowed the sidewalks, which were 20 feet to seven feet to keep traffic flowing and stage construction appropriately. And in stripping away those 13 feet, all of the trees 
all of the benches, all of the streetlights, all of the actual expensive stuff is in those first 13 feet. And so actually the cost of street restoration becomes much more expensive where if you didn't have to shut down the street, right, you don't incur those costs because you don't have to replace all that stuff. Um, so this is another thing about traffic being a big issue. But the, the other side on, on the utility costs, because it's a thing of, I think, of great interest, um, is that absolutely it does add costs. You know, power companies, water companies, they ask for new materials. They see it as an opportunity to upgrade their systems as well. But in terms of the overall percentage of the project, yeah, it is often seen as, you know, not 50%. So it might be smaller. But that's the thing, I think, with all of our projects is sort of if you want to bring costs down, you have to look at multiple things across the board. There isn't just one sort of silver bullet to say, design, build, and you're, you know, drop the mic and walk away. Um, it's, it, it's, it, it's trying to eat into all of these, you know, thousand different um, line items. Yeah, yeah, even in New York, I mean, in, in New York with the, I don't know, 10 X costs, um, it's never one thing. In New York, it's, I don't know, three, four very big things um, that make it 10 X, 10 X over, normal places and maybe 50 knots over lower cost method. Okay, well, we have gone two hours and this group I think could talk for 15 yeah. more. <laughs> but uh, I, I don't know, Eric, I don't think you wanna give us to, to close. No, I think this has been great. Thank you everyone for, for joining. Um, and, you know, please check out uh, the cases. They're, they're, they're really wonderful. I've read them a lot and I love them and I can, I can quote them to my, to my children. Um, and so if you run into me on the street, I will, I will quote them to you too. Uh, but thanks everyone for, for coming and there'll be like a, an email thanking everyone and with some links and stuff like that. Uh, but get in touch, you know, contact Marco and LF, you know, directly about whatever questions you might have, you can send them to me too, or to Alan. Um, and, you know, we'll do this again. Thank you. Bye. And thanks everyone for uh, tuning into our panel. Yeah, thank you.